permeability. Okay, for a drug to enter an organ, it must permeate all membrane that separate the organ from the site of administration. How about the metabolism? Metabolism actually differs from people to people. That's why you can see whenever they give the drug for certain people, you can see that the effect actually varies between individuals. So the body attempts to rid itself of a foreign substance or preparation intended to be placed in contact external. Kalau external je, adalah cosmetic. Itu je dia punya keyword yang you kena ingat, the gist of it, that's all. Okay, yang ini dia kena compliant with the GMP and then GSP. And then uh, kalau you nak buat masuk drug daripada luar, you kena ada LOA, Letter of Authorization. Cosmetic pun sama juga, mana you nak buat dari Korea, Japan, you have to be appointed by them. Alright, and then fee dia fifty ringgit, and then two uh, two years. Alright, now let's move on to the aesthetic medicine. Alright, some of the drug ni ada yang common, ada yang tadi just introductory lah untuk drug drug yang kita guna dekat aesthetic medicine dekat Malaysia. Even though dia pun guna juga this drug. Okay, sekarang ni kita ada a few sources. Saya nak tanya, how do you know that this drug is registered in Malaysia? You kata ada mal. Tapi kat mana nak cari drug yang ada mal ni? Kau boleh nak tengok reservoir dia. Where can you find the reference of all mal drugs? Kau nak tengok? Kau boleh nak tengok? Kat biar ni kat mana? Where can you get this drug list of all drug ni registered kat Malaysia? Kau nak cari? Means consists of all drug registered in Malaysia. Second, product leaflet or product insert. Dekat sini you can tahu drug registered kat Malaysia. So, paling senang MIMS lah. You boleh guna MIMS get the way. MIMS get the way tu is the reservoir untuk semua drug registered kat Malaysia. Now, how about blue book? Blue book ada apa? Blue book tu ada senarai ubat yang boleh digunakan di fasiliti KKM sahaja. Tapi blue book ni subset daripada MIMS. Tapi our own hospital, own PKD, own KK ada dia punya own drug formulary which is subset of the blue book. Boleh faham tak yang tu? Can you get it? So that means that the blue book consists of all drug can be used in MOH facilities while our own health facility and MOH ni akan ada dia punya own designated formulary which is subset of the blue book. Okay, ada tak drug yang tak berdaftar di Malaysia tapi digunakan di Australia Kerajaan? Can you bring the drug that is not registered in Malaysia, no MOL to Malaysia? Can you bring it in or not? Boleh tak kita bawa masuk drug yang tidak berdaftar uh, dengan DCA digunakan di Malaysia? Boleh ke tak boleh? boleh? Can or not? Boleh. Kalau boleh, macam mana? Kalau tak boleh, kenapa? Boleh kalau Boleh kalau emergency nak bawa masuk macam mana? Alright, kalau pandemik punya, okay tak good So macam covid lah, kita banyak pakai off-label lah Ataupun kita ada pakai tak berdaftar juga Kita pakai hari tu Yang Fuji punya daripada Jepun punya tu Yang kita bawa masuk, okay tapi sekarang ni Kalau nak bawa masuk drug-drug tak berdaftar ni Siapa yang boleh bagi kelulusan? Okay, semua orang pernah dengar tak? Ubat dengan kelulusan khas Masih ke hospital dulu Pernah tak dia ada drug list yang hanya penama Sahaja boleh guna drug tu Ubat ini boleh bawa masuk ke Malaysia dengan kelulusan oleh DG Ataupun kita akan panggil ubat KPK Kalau you pernah dekat Dukat Oscar House pun, you ingat tahu lah Ada medical, <coughs> banyak lah medical, hemato semua Onko, mereka akan guna ubat-ubat ni Maknanya ubat-ubat dengan kelulusan khas ketua pengarah kesihatan Bagi ubat DG lah, maknanya tak ada mal, tak registered, dia bawa masuk Ataupun waktu lagi nak guna off-label indication Indication in drug info dalam lexicom Tak sesuanya boleh guna dekat Malaysia Kita hanya boleh guna indication yang listed dalam blue book sahaja You can only use the drug if the indication are listed in the blue book You have to understand the whole process of when drug being registered in Malaysia So kalau off-label pun, you can minta permission Dia sama je, ubat-ubat, okay, let's say drug tu tak ada registered kat Malaysia Nak buat masuk dia, kita kena guna apa? Kena bawa apa? Dia tak ada yang kelulusan kat Malaysia pun, bila you buat masuk, you need what? You, what do you require? You require a license, permit Permit import Same goes to kereta-kereta import Kena ada orang punya uh, Nak buat masuk Malaysia kan Sama juga dengan ubat Ubat pun ada permit import Permit import ni Dia spesifik kepada Pemegang lesen sahaja It lasts for one year Kalau patient tu pass away This is semua Kita kena pulangkan balik Ubat-ubat tu Sama juga Okay So you have to know All of this capacity 
Maknanya ubat-ubat yang off label pun kena minta kelulusan biji Maknanya off label berubuk Ataupun off label dekat Malaysia seterusnya Kadang-kadang drug ni register kat Malaysia masuk DCA Dia senarikan 8 indication When they wanted to enter the blue book, they only need it for 4 So another 4 tak minta pun Kamu tak minta pun So this are the thing that lies between the registration you all kena tahu Okay? So at least for now you all, you have to know whether it's actually indicated in the blue book Or indicated in the means or only indicated dengan FDA Tiga-tiga ni kena tahu so let's say you prescribe the patient with the indication that not being portrayed in the Malaysian registration, anything happen, you have to bear it. That's why you can going to consensus patient, consent drug, consent form with the off-label indication. Okay? Alright. Alright, for Anapalin, we have the topical. Alright, actually it's indicated for acne. However, it's contradict for those who actually have sensitivity to Anapalin or component of the product. All the notes we provided in your list Alright, how does adapalin work? It's actually bind to specific retaining acid nuclear receptors and modulate cellular differentiation, cratonization and inflammatory process. With this MOE, that's why it can help to reduce and control our acne. However, how which one is the which one is unknown. You mean? Yeah, juga KKM. Tukar si KKM yang report kat siapa KKM tu? You pun KKM juga. DC tak, DC tak jaga, DC drug control authority je You shall report to the enforcement pharmacy dekat semua negeri yang ada Dekat situ yang diorang akan tahu, kita akan ada orang yang jadi undercover Semua yang akan buat, uh, apa, rating semula diorang akan buat You will report, you can report actually to all the enforcement Semua yang drug yang keluar bila drug-drug yang dah dialtitrated ke Withdrawn from the market is through the enforcement Okay, you all will report actually Okay, ascorbic acid ialah untuk anti-aging Alright, day application Apply dekat face and neck Practice, uh, because Beside the structure You have to know the function of it Because when you are talking about function You are talking about Compare, uh, and then let's say you cannot close. You put the skin graft. When you have a discontinuity of this aesthetic unit, it becomes very obvious. Okay? So, katalah you got a lesion. Kalau lesion about, you will lose about 10% uh, of this area, fine lah. It's not that obvious, very small. And then you can actually close, when you can play around with your, your lines. But you got, you need to replace that you better replace the whole unit. Huh? Kalau you ada PCC sini, yeah, they will get involved about 50% of the area, for example. You better remove all and put a uh, full thickness skin graft, whatever, in one unit. And then the outcome is going to be much better. Alright? Reason? Because this is three-dimensional. Whenever you move the, 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 the reflections of the light when on the, on the surface, huh? Certain uh, discontinuity of the color of the skin, it will reflect differently. So that's why, kalau you dapat for fifty percent area in the same reflection area, then it become very obvious. Huh? The worst is reflection the same area you compare to the other side, it become very asymmetry. Huh? Kalau belah sini sama belah sini, then you got two reflect different apa, reflections both side. Okay lah, huh? takkan tapi takkan you nak buang disease here separuh dan you nak buang disease here separuh kan? Kena saman lah you. Huh? So hmm. that's why you you always go by aesthetic you ni. Dia macam-macam ah. -macam, In general, yang yang cheap this is one you need for. Sekarang dia orang orang apa, apa divider itu A B <coughs> A B C D the border is your nasolabial fold infraorbital and zygomatic right and then this is your jawline <coughs> and then because of the three dimensional this is the anterior 
Yang ni oblique And then this is posterior So that's why become ABC And and B is actually On your zygomatic prominence So you are talking about Kalau uh, light my lead, So it become the, the flat surface is different So flat surface of this Compared to this Compared, compared to this is different huh? So that's why Kalau same flat surface Different tone Then it become very obvious <coughs> Right, when you go deep, it's actually reflects into your <coughs> facial fat, huh? and facial fat is not a one continuous fat; it's a compartmental uh, fat. Huh? So that's why you got a depression, you got a, a, a convex upper area of the different face is actually different. <coughs> This is important because when you have uh, a uh, Volume is actually less You got a laxity of the skin Alright And then kita punya face The spring back of the skin Is actually not that great Alright Especially in when you have a So called acceptate In between which is actually prolonged already Extended already During a uh, healthy fat face Then when they, they didn't pull back Unless Macam you put you pakai bekum after you beranak lah You put uh, the, a face mask Control the, the laxity Then maybe you got a chance Tak ada orang nak pakai mask 24 hours ini. <coughs> so that's the reason In fact when you are actually You can actually use this As or your Your knowledge when you want to do a filler <coughs> Okay always respect this Right <coughs> So you got a space already It's just that the content volume is actually less So that's why it become certain certain uh, Right it there hmm? Right it is actually a A relations of A different aesthetic unit huh? masa, tu, masa young age you got a flat relation Now One one is actually going towards that, the other one going towards that, so it become obvious reflections. So that's why you got a reti, <coughs> right? So that's why we got a, a lot of map for for fillers. <coughs> huh? It's actually based. You see that okay? This is mela. This is nasolabial. Sometimes we got actually there, huh? jawline, right? <coughs> And it, uh, so far, okay. Nose is a focal point of the face. Uh, it's very sensitive, right? So that's why a nose procedure is the most common procedure that been performed in aesthetic field. Okay. In Korea. In fact, been 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 estimated that about 90% of the women in Korea is actually having a aesthetic procedure on the nose, right? <coughs> um, reason is because Asian nose is actually vastly different than Caucasian nose, <coughs> right? So you need to have a projection angle between uh, 30 to 46%. This is the projection angle. <coughs> And columella lip angle, columella lip angle supposed to be about 90% in men and 95% to 810 in women. <coughs> Why? <coughs> Because usually a male nose is actually a bit longer than female nose. <coughs> and two to three millimeter wide angle segment of the columella should be seen from the side. Okay, kalau you tengok daripada tepi, you should see the lower border of the columella. It's supposed to be doomed down a bit. So you should actually see that that angle. <coughs> okay, on surface anatomy, you got uh, started with the nation there. You got dorsum, you got tip. So tip is actually when you see from the lateral, is actually the, the the most prominent part. Huh? That's the tip. Below that is infratip. Above that is the supratip. 
So you got Ella, you got Nord Stream, all right? You don't got a columella. So in inside you got a dosum and then you got a lateral wall. And this is been considered as different aesthetic unit as well for nose. <clears throat> Alright. Uh structure wise you got a bony part, nasal bone, and then after that you got a septal cartilage, you got upper lateral, you got lower lateral. And you got central like a cartilage, <clears throat> and uh, it's a very variable in terms of the cartilage shape as well as the volume of the cartilage. Uh, so, <clears throat> especially in Asian, uh, I think the reason of Asian is actually uh, more variable because I think the mixture of the uh, blood in in Asia is much greater than. The Caucasian or the, the Middle East. <clears throat> so that's how you go to Africa, they have a similar nose, everybody. But in Asia, it's very different. <clears throat> but the ideal nose is supposed to be having a very good curvilinear line. So when you draw from the uh, eyebrow, go down onto, uh, onto your, your upper lateral, uh, lower lateral cartilage, it's supposed to be one line. Lah. In fact, which actually some people actually suggested that it is supposed to be a linear line up to your lateral ella. It's supposed to be a, a, a linear curve, nerve curve, curve linear line, bilaterally symmetrical. <coughs> okay. Um, change in that is going to be very obvious, especially when they are asymmetric. Okay. Color change to the line, but symmetry is still acceptable. Okay. <coughs> And, and in lower face, you got a certain certain line as well. <clears throat> I think I mentioned that earlier when you are there. Right? Lip proportion also has to be one third, one third. Upper lip is supposed to be one third, lower lip is going to be two third. Right? In the middle side, you got a filtral column. Right? Filtral column, and then you got a, a, a vermilion and skin junction where we call a white room. White row, you look at your friend on the side, I know everybody on the mask, it's, become, it's very obvious. Why? Because a different color tone and the most prominent, when you are talking about reflections, this is the most obvious reflection that you see under light. So that's why disruptions of this line is going to be very obvious. Alright? So when you are actually doing something, make sure you don't damage that row. Huh? Become very obvious. <clears throat> Not so much on the lower because you got a prominence vermilion on your lower lip. Too prominent, both sides. So that will actually sort of obliterate the white row of the lower lip. Upper lip, make sure that you don't damage that, whatever you do. <clears throat> okay? Reason? To crack it. Very, very difficult. Huh? Nampak simple aja, then do so what? But to correct it, to get it nicely done, matching very hundred percent matching is very difficult. Sometimes you need to reverse few times, huh? Because you are talking about a dynamic structure underneath. Okay, kalau you tutup and do you you approximate it nicely, also still you got a chance to actually move when you actually talking about moving the orbicular wrist or wrist muscle. You have to move orbicular uh, muscle, you cannot stop that because they want to eat. So that's that, how, how difficult it is. <clears throat> right? For your orbits, again, <clears throat> the normal one, you see the normal one, okay? So you got a lateral canter, medial canter, medial canter, lateral canter. This distance from here to here, here to here, here to here is. One third, one third, one third again. Right? Roughly lah. Of course, now people are talking about the middle or the, the letter is 1.0, 1.018, I think. Or 1.18, something like that. And then he's actually 1 and then 1.018 again. It's a bit different on the uh, intercantal <coughs> compared to the uh, nasal. <coughs> when you have a 
you don't have you call it cyclopia ada tak ada there's no canter uh, there's no apa canter you got when you got the uh, between the two media canter you got hypothyroidism alright normal is normal lah so tele canter when you got bigger bigger than one third so ada tele canter hypothyroidism when you got a bony part of it eh? you got bony part or nasal is actually why so you got a hypothyroidism and you can actually have hypothyroidism and tele canter <coughs> both Huh? Right? I'm not telling about the blocking now. Eh? I'm telling about the anatomy. So you got a orbicularis oris muscle, and then usually they insert into your end of the tarsal plate and and into the skin. Right? It's actually to the skin and then connected with the tarsal plate. You got a mullous muscle there. It's actually where your eyelid crease right <clears throat> and then uh, you got a septum uh, orbital septum and uh, this is a very sensitive septum because behind that is a very loose areola tissue right if you do anything on your uh, eyelid make sure that you don't go inside there so you go inside that small bleed Ah, uh, will actually extend all the way up to your retro orbital because this is very loose area. So make sure that you don't actually break that. <coughs> okay. <coughs> uh, lower lid also like that, right? <coughs> the aesthetic medicine as well as aesthetic surgery. <coughs> right? <coughs> and and you know lah, apa plastic surgeon for example, they are actually in big hospital but patient is actually usually will go to the, the smaller scale of the clinic first isn't it so you are the frontliner for aesthetic medical practice <coughs> so that's why you cannot run away you have to know at least the basic principle of it right uh, you <coughs> and then you know what how to direct your patients hmm? and the most important is uh at least you know the danger of it eh? It's not simple. Ah, uh, you dengar that uh, come somebody comes and do a filler in hotel room or that. And so, because it's very simple. Yes, the procedure is very simple, but the complications not not simple anymore. Okay. Ah, uh, for example, yang I I said just now, right? Ah, uh, 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 filler filler injection is to the sinus, for example. Ah, uh, you are talking about trauma embolism to your brain. So you, you, that's why patient can up, end up with death, right? You're talking about fat embolism, for example. Huh? You do a, a filler, you, you go into your your bloodstream, then you can have the emboli. So it's very serious, right? So that's why you need to take all sort of precautions to actually avoid that. <clears throat> Sorry, I thought everybody's in. Luckily, slide is still there. <laughs> uh, most common uh, structure that people are looking for aesthetic procedure is the breast. Lah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, in fact, breast work is actually number two in Brazil. Okay, and and in in South America, other South America country also is still number two, right? In 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 the US is actually number I think number two as well. It's just that in here in this side of the the world is actually we are actually more towards upper part, not the at the lower part. <clears throat> right? So everybody knows that uh, breast is actually a modified sweat gland. Huh? you are talking about gland structure uh, apa, apa, uh, accumulated in certain some of our capsule that is actually uh, a group of the sweat gland <coughs> so it lies in subcutaneous tissue uh, in the superficial fascia and then 
is between two second and fourth uh, rib, and then your nipple areola complex supposed to be at your fourth intercostal space. <coughs> And then you got a prolongation uh, to the lateral side where you actually call that axillary tail of Spencer's. <clears throat> and and then on the that dissections, you got uh, this is the axillary tail of the breast, and then this is the breast tissue in the capsule, which is not that obvious. Um, you need to have very good experience to actually identify that because. Uh, there is actually a, a, a so-called distinct difference between the subcutaneous fat and then the, the fat, uh, the, 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 the tubular structure of the breast. <clears throat> right? And then they actually lies on the pectoral muscle and then the projections of the breast are supposed to be uh, nipple areola at the center there and then you got this uh, smooth curve uh, in, in, inframemory full towards the knee and then uh, the, the nipple areola complex and on top also superior pole also supposed to be convex uh, towards your, your, your um, uh, upper chest. <clears throat> okay, if you go and that side is actually a lobule of the gland, right? Separated by the septae and then um, a, a group of uh, a, a sweat gland and then it drains into your nipple. <clears throat> and then it's actually been, been whole. The hole is actually been whole by just a suspensory ligament. The problem with the suspensory ligament is a very uh, weak uh, fibrous tissue and then they spring they are, they are spring back uh, structure or, or function is very similar to your any other um, uh, septate which is actually having a function of, of suspension like your, your facial fat I had said earlier on it's, it's a little similar <coughs> Arterial supply is actually from all around okay you got on top there you got the thoraco um, acromium, uh, th thoracic branch of thoraco acromium, you got intercostal, lateral intercostal, you got medial intercostal from internal memory, where you got a perforator in uh, every single intercostal space. <clears throat> and then this, all this vessel is actually form the anastomosis network, okay? So that's why in terms of the breast reductions, you can actually take out anywhere then they actually interconnecting in between this uh, surrounding vessel like I said earlier on. Right. <coughs> uh, um <coughs> the blood supply. <coughs> so you got from lateral thoracic, you got thoracoacromium, you got uh, internal memory, perforator, it's actually all come up together and then and then uh, per anastomosis between themselves into up to the your nipple areola complex and and nipple areola complex is actually having the a bit of more uh, and a rich anastomosis and then connected inside okay so that's why uh, nipple areola complex you can actually uh, cut as you wish to actually get the desirable shape but they actually survive huh? In fact, uh, but when you can actually, when you're talking about uh, circum areola uh, breast implant, you can you can even cut almost uh, two thirds of it, and still they actually survive. <coughs> Venus is actually um, following the artery to the uh, axillary, intercostal as well as vertebral. Uh, the the posterior lateral thoracic it goes into the, uh, your your Vertebra. And that's the reason why breast cancer, the most uh, among the most common metastasis is to your spine. Right? <clears throat> okay, lymphatic, um seventy five percent is the easy lateral axillary nodes, mainly on the anterior group. Okay. <clears throat> Logic again, this actually at your next to your your, your breast is actually your anterior uh, part of the axillary drainage. 
and then they actually direct drainage to supracurricular nodes and then there is minor pathway to open only to major channels right okay this is how diagrammatically it's actually uh, distributed so mainly is on the uh, media at the anterior mainly but you can actually go up to your direct to your supraavicular through your internal memory punya group <coughs> okay and this is follow your 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 mainly your artery and vein okay this is following the thoracoacromia this is uh, following the internal uh, memory and this follow from the, the your your lateral thoracic <coughs> Nerve supply, <coughs> same follow the the, the uh, vasculature. Uh, one is from the lateral subcutaneous intercostal, internal memory, nerve, uh, lateral, lateral, okay, internal memory, and then superior aspect is innervated by the fourth or cervical plexus. Okay, <coughs> so that's a reason why when you actually pl pl planning the press reduction and so that you actually can create a pedicle or pedicle just based on either one. That's why you come across uh, the uh, inferior pedicle press reduction, medial pedicle, uh, uh, lateral pedicle, like that. <clears throat> and then uh, this actually uh, the sensitive part, the most sensitive part is for your, your next upper nipple area complex. And then mainly is actually from a lateral cutaneous plan, the fourth, some of the fifth intercostal space, lateral. So that's why you, you, you seldom come across people are doing uh, resections based on the lateral. Eh? Right? <clears throat> okay. Um, Laterally, how this appear, and then this is uh, so-called schematic diagram of how the suspension ligament is actually holding the breast. Lah. Okay, the problem is when you are actually having this suspension ligament laxity, then you are actually having the torti breast, and then like I said earlier on, it has to be uh, the the, op, the lower pole has to be above the inframemory pole. And then this nipple areola complex has to be above this um, uh, inframemory pole, um, usually at the uh, fourth intercostal space. And this is normal when you have this lower pole lower, or this nipple areola is actually lower. Then you are actually having a totic breast. <coughs> we will discuss later on how we classify that. Again, same. Right, so we go to the common problem static breast. When this is most common complaint when the patient comes to aesthetic uh, clinic with regards to their breast uh, problems. So <coughs> the true or complete ptosis, when you peel uh, the inflammatory pole uh, and then and then one finger at the level of the uh, nipple, so you put and your finger at the inframemory pole and then you locate the nipple areola complex where it is right so that's how you actually tell that this is a a totic breast <clears throat> so gland skin nipple descend together and if the nipple is that level or lower in the it lower than inframemory pole then this is actually a totic breast and so you put a finger uh, at the inframemory pole level and then you see the level of the nipple areola complex at the level, or level lower to it, we consider that as a uh, totic breast. As long as they are actually above the inframemory fold, it uh, can, can add a normal breast, or sometimes we call pseudo totic breast. <coughs> okay, first degree, when you have a nipple at the level of inframemory fold, above the lower contour of the breast, means that this is the let's say mana yang okay okay this is the the one okay now you that's inframemory fold this nipple area complex is below the inframemory fold bawah with the inframemory fold in the inframemory fold but still above the lower contour of the breast right so that is a minor or second first degree second degree 
nipple lies below the level of inframundo but still above the lower contour okay so ni dah below the inframundo fold but still above the lower contour so that is a second degree and the third degree when you have both that is lower than yeah than inframundo fold the implications of classifying this is actually when you have a first degree, you might get away with a, a fat injection, fat transfer or implant. Okay, fat stage up a second degree also like that, are more towards implant. Huh? But the the third degree, most of the time, we're not, not going to work with the fat transfer or implant. But of course, people are saying that you have to, again, you do a multiple sessions of fat transfer you might get away with it eh? uh, the reason i think is because of when you do a fat transfer that is not it's not just a fat transfer we are talking about introductions of uh, uh, mesenchymal stem cell so maybe you got the chance that you actually uh, rejuvenate the skin it's not just about the uh, breast tissue <clears throat> Right, pseudotosis nipple lies above the inframammary fold, and then, uh, but skin is actually very relaxed, and this is usually because of the hypoplasia, secondary to loss of weight or maternity, uh, post maternity. <clears throat> you can have a partial ptosis, you can have. Uh, laxity, just a skin, and then um, uh, it is because of gravity, okay? <coughs> so this is pseudotosis, and and minor tosis is actually the uh, type one just now, uh, first degree. All right, so. Um, Interesting about anatomy, macam macam. Everybody now talking about anatomy. When people are indulged in certain certain area, they will name it the anatomy. You, re you realize that or not? Because that's how interesting it is. You whatever, whatever you want to do, you have to know what you are doing, uh, what area you are actually entering, and then and that is the anatomy. Right? Then that's all. Thank you. And, and it, this is among the textbook. Banyak buku yang aesthetic uh, 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 anatomy that you can actually have. And the good thing is, most of the, this book is actually not that popular. So when you are talking about book that is not popular, they can easily be found on your net. Tak ada protection saya. So you can actually have that. Eh? At least partial of it. <coughs> Of course, this is book by Wiley Blackwell. It's actually quite protected, eh? but it's just a lot other anatomy with a quite a reasonable. It's just that uh, the good, uh, the the interesting about anatomy is <coughs> when a, a, a so-called non-anatomist written about the anatomy, uh, it's actually a bit different. Eh? Some even even in between themselves also different based on their interest. Uh, and then, and then, uh, when they are actually doing certain certain research in that uh, area, they are actually in certain, good in certain area only. So always uh, read anatomy when you are talking about functional anatomy. Always read with open mind and try to criticize. Then only become interesting. All right, I think that's all. Thank you. So. so an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage okay kita biasa do apa belittle our vision last time when we will start working in it kita lah like, uh, we are the king we are doctors so everybody should listen to us but we forgot that it's an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience that is actually important for us to actually uh, describe the pain <coughs> so, associated with actual 
or potential tissue damage or this kind of term of such damage okay so when you are talking about pain always remember when when patients say pain is actually pain so this is the international association for study of pain uh, descriptions so how the pain is actually been perceived by our patients so we got a receptor <coughs> Okay, where usually is A delta or C fiber horn, when they actually bring the signal to your spinal cord to the telomeres state brain stem to the cortex where the perceptions of and modulations of perceptions and respond to pain be, be translate and then go back into your telomeres state brain stem and just spinal uh, uh, cord and then give the reactions to whatever necessary to actually avoid that pain. <coughs> right? Either you draw back your, your things from pain or you manipulate how to actually get the comfort of the pain. That's a normal process. So you got the receptor, you got the <coughs> um, um, <coughs> so-called cable, and then you got the uh, motherboard processor. Okay? So sounds long journey, isn't it? But the process from here to here and back is in, in micro or milli or nanosecond. Right. I give you an example. You got you on the Swiss or the TMB on the Swiss, uh, hundred kilometer away. You almost immediate. You got the power supply, isn't it? So you are talking about the nerve, which is actually electrical electricity conduction that almost immediate they will actually respond. So that's why the process is so fast. Okay. So in detail. <coughs> So you got a nociceptor, free nerve ending, C or A delta, then you got a stimulus, then you actually go through dorsal horn to the spinal cord and it goes into, through the spinal uh, uh, thalami or spinal reticular tracts, it goes into your thalamus brainstem and then go to contact back, they perceive and then go back and do give a response. This nociceptor can be found in skin, it's actually a lot. <coughs> And then the somatic structure, joints or viscera, so almost everywhere. And then the response, the nociceptor is actually respond to a certain, certain, not just the inflammation, sometimes the uh, pressure also can actually got that. Huh? That's why you got the uh, intestinal uh, pain, it's not the inflammation, it's some contractions. Uh, expand the expansion is actually causing the irritations to it and then being 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 uh, positive uh, translate as pain <coughs> so <coughs> logically when you have this kind of complex track so how you can you can control so you should think that okay maybe you can actually intercept in whatever uh, uh, level Right, so you can intercept at this level, you can intercept at that level, you can intercept at that level. Okay, so logically, lah. All right, and then a certain certain treatment that available is actually it may not be working here, may not be working there, may not be working there. Huh? It's not just that you know where to block to control the pain. You have to think that that might not be working. All right, so maybe you target and then after that it's not working. Huh? So that's why the turning point is you will need to actually listen to your patients. So when they say pain, it's a pain. When they say it's not relief, it's not relief. All right? <clears throat> I remember when I was young, uh, we, yeah, lah, your, 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 your senior told you confidently, okay, give this. Pain settle, huh? so you pun follow lah macam budak bodoh follow, and patients start complaining. Who do you believe, your patients, your or your senior? Your senior lah, so actually you are the one who bodoh. Huh? So, so remember that the pain is very complex. It can actually affect anywhere. Your treatment can be anywhere, but it might not be working anywhere. Uh, so the point is, you need to actually know whether this is actually really pain or not. Of course, there is some small percentage of patients that uh, mengada-ngada adalah, right? 
And remember, you are actually talking about pain thresholds. Right? Not painful for you, may be very painful to others. <clears throat> Alright? So, remember, pain is what the patient says hurt. Okay? <clears throat> and, and, and further on top of that, it's not a job about the physical, it's about the emotional as well. Right? So, pain is actually, sometimes it's actually not really pain, but it's actually um, um, emotional and sometimes we call it that <clears throat> cognitive pain. Huh? Especially in children, okay. So that's why in children sometimes more towards a general blocking the process, pro, uh, process, uh, process or perception of pain. It actually more uh, uh, positive uh, or more advantageous in in children because you are talking about cognitive pain, <coughs> right? They will cut the nota already, so you have to beat that. <coughs> <coughs> so it's very subjective <coughs> and and from 1980s when 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 doctor realized they are not god <coughs> then only they start to study whether they are actually right or not Sell, telling that patient actually just want to complain eh? then all the study start to be in 1980s and surprisingly they found out that <coughs> It's really significant. Huh? Post-operative pain control is and required has not advanced significantly for many years. Eh? 1980s, much like too, about 75 percent. Now, HKR a few years ago doing the same study, uh, 79 percent non-control. Okay. Sorry. I think I want to say something this I forgot already. <laughs> I'm 50 years old. Forgive me for that. <laughs> oh, okay. The first uh, the most uh, the most recent study says that this actually this uh, uh, is actually stays for at least the first 48 hours. So when you are actually doing procedure, make sure you are actually taking care of patients, not just post-operatively. Make sure you extend your your concern up to forty eight for to forty eight hours. Eh? Then some says is at least seventy two hours. By logic, when you are under the understanding the inflammatory process of the cell is supposed to be seventy two hours. Okay, <clears throat> but study says forty eight hours. Pain is about most of this is actually about the inflammation. Do you understand the inflammation inflammatory process is supposed to be about? Uh, 72 hours. <clears throat> okay. <coughs> if I couldn't actually do a uh, study in the 1990s, they recorded quite high pain score as the sixth day after their operation. This is understandable because when you're actually having the inflammation, you got another cycle of uh, process where at the three, third to fifth day, then when your, your, your macrophage become a dominant cell to actually uh, combat the inflammation, this is where the maximum of the process on the fifth day. Uh, so the clearance of debris or that is actually on the fifth day is actually the maximum. So you can actually understand that. You can have that uh, about, after about six days. And uh, this is what we call sort of secondary inflammation. Uh? So that is another level that you need to actually take care of when you're actually talking about the pain. <clears throat> Am I right? NSMO, I'm an NS specialist? <laughs> yes or no? I think so. <laughs> okay. So this is among the reason why we are actually having a very poor uh, post-operative uh, pain. Inadequate pain assessment. Huh? <clears throat> We kita nak cepat ya when you're talking about pain. Uh, in fact, that is actually the most important, uh, as especially when you actually do your private work practice. This is your selling point. You take care of their pain well, they will come back, they will start contribute up uh, spread the, the news that oh I have been to this clinic, no pain, post-op no pain. 
If you got a pain, I you don't put, you tak payah pergi di sekeliling lah. Very painful procedure. This is your selling point. <coughs> so that's why you need to assess pain. Huh? In fact, when you come up, a patient come for follow up or that, always remember to ask about the first one with regard to pain. Then only they, they know that you are like a concerned doctor in terms of the control of the pain. <coughs> and this is another one. Uh, pain relief is actually a pain. And then I remember when you uh, first start working, yang mana senior bagi that the one you give and then you don't even change it. Okay? Follow je. Eh? The problem is because at that time you do something and eh, you'll be scolded lah of course. Eh? That's why you keep continue all doing the same thing because your senior also is actually practicing the same thing. Okay? I have actually doing a bit different because I like to read the pamphlet. Okay? Dia ada punya box or that. You got dia punya pamphlet kan? That's among the things that I like to write last like, uh, to, to read last time. So that's the reason why actually you are actually uh, brave enough lah. Huh? In general, we are talking about pain control in Malaysia. You are safe even at your maximum dose. Huh? Because Malaysia uh, very in terms of safety is quite good. <coughs> we are actually at the half. So you got another half to actually go for maximum, at the actual maximum. How many of you all give local to your patient having the uh, overdose? None, isn't it? Huh? Because usually the dose that you've been suggested in Malaysia is half, the upper threshold. <clears throat> but you have to understand that like, again, when you actually understand the pain cycle, then you know like, which drug works well, best works well, what's the advantage, disadvantage, what the side effect of that. Then only you actually secure and then, then only you actually brave enough to give a different. Huh? <clears throat> then the other thing is uh, methods of the uh, administrations. Okay? Uh, takut sangat nak bagi IV, isn't it? Huh? How many of you feel that? Most of the time when you actually start working, it's very difficult, scared to give IV, for example. Paling paling pun you give IM. Huh? In fact, a certain drug is really the best. It's giving IV because you know that the both the dose reach the bloodstream and then go to the affected side is actually maximum. <clears throat> like I said, our dose is actually half of the upper dose. So why are you actually worried? Huh? So you actually wasted a lot of the drug potential when you're actually giving wrong methods. <clears throat> Sometimes we are actually very rel uh, uh, reluctant to give opioid. Opioid you know very well that it's actually working not the local. It's actually blocking at a certain level of the pain threat. So logically, it's supposed to be much better because <clears throat> when you actually uh, effect at the local, most of the time you're actually talking about combating the inflammation of that area or signal that actually received by nerve end. Inflama inflammation, when you actually at a certain level, it will never be blocked by any drug. Okay? You touch area, you try to give the local into the inflammatory, inflamed tissue, whether it's going to work or not. It never works unless you go into the normal surrounding tissue. You inject into the inflamed tissue will never work. Okay, <clears throat> so logically you have to go. Yeah, you boleh handle lah. Inflamed inflamed tissue will never work. Then you go somewhere else. Means that you control at the any any level of the uh, pain track. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So how do body respond to pain? This is how why why important that you actually need to control the pain, huh? especially in the patients that at their level of uh, upper level of the complication threshold already, huh? upper upper agile patient, old patient, so that you have to actually control because any stress or extra stress it will goes into the upper threshold of heart attack, for example. Huh? 
uh, your, your your respiratory problem, for example, and it will go and then go into that that area. So that's why you have to actually be aware of that. Okay, <clears throat> so it will involve the all major and then physiological system. Okay, the the how the body respond. Huh? You know, already, you have pain, you 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 having a increased heart rate at least. Huh? Sometimes you have a T. Huh? So it's all actually involved there. So that's why it's very important for you to control the pain in the CVS. You will actually increase the sympathetic response when you have a pain. So that's why you have a uh, tachycardia, and then you've got a, uh, when you have tachycardia not responding to your body uh, physiology, then you have you will have an increased BP, and then. You will increase the myocardial work and oxygen consumption of your body. So at the end of the day, you're going to have a myocardial function. Because of the poor myocardial function, then you can actually, because of pain itself, can cause death. All right? In respiratory system, pain from thoracoabdominal wounds may produce uh, pulmonary change because you're actually holding that. And because movement will cause more pain. <coughs> So they will actually increase in intraabdominal muscle tone, and they will also, as I said, with decrease in deformity function. So at the end of the day, you will have inability to come or clear your secretion, and you know what? Eh? Next is actually you can have a lung collapse, <clears throat> then because of that poor secretion, so that and then you have plus you are actually just post intubation, for example, you have a very easy pneumonia and then of course again pneumonia will increase the burden of management of of, of, of anemia and the pneumonia huh? just simple because you are unable to control the pain you end up giving more problem that you need to handle <coughs> in your GIT <coughs> so you will increase the sympathetic tone you know that actually will actually cause you increase gastric intestinal secretion one and then uh, they, it will decrease the gut motility as well, right? And then, so you end up with alias, nausea, and vomiting. And then, you know, like, after that, you can actually have the uh, aspirations, whatever reason. Eh? And then, again, after that, you can, in fact, you will actually increase, decrease your, your proteins of the body, and then, at the end of the day, end up with the poor wound healing as well. <coughs> so, pain, and then also will increase the sympathetic tone, and then increase the uh, uh, smooth and muscle of the splinter tone, and then you have a uh, anuria, okay? urinary retention. Hmm? And then, and, and, and the worst is actually that complication will end up another type of pain. Huh? So you got gut immobility, then you got bloated, you know very well that nociception for intestinal is the pressure so we have another pain and then you got two another cycle of pain <clears throat> your musculoskeletal system <clears throat> pain will prevent mobilization and increase muscular tone so dvd right and then this is uh, can be fatal as well <clears throat> so in traditional methods that we common, we, we, we actually used to use this. In fact, now also still <laughs> we are using this, you know, in Malaysia at least. So, I am huh? Almost, I don't know how this pathidin comes to Malaysia, history, history wise, because when I first started working 30 years ago, we have already used pathidin. Even now, it's actually we're still using Petidin. Uh, except in my unit, in the consultative science in the USM, we didn't use Petidin anymore. Um, yes, we use Orient Sick. <coughs> but you can argue lah, because I'm managing the burn when you're talking about pain. And I am Petidin is not uh, uh, so called good because you want to, don't want to injure any injury to the skin, you don't want lah. So that's why we always do give no opioid. <clears throat> so, how do you uh, decide to uh, 
do a pain control in your patient. So it's actually depend on patient factor, surgical factor, nursing factor, cause, other factors. Huh? Patient factor means that allergy, blah, blah, blah. Huh? And then uh, certain, certain patients require sedations, huh? analgesic with sedations, certain don't need. Okay, so you have to consider that. Anxious patient, for sure you need that. If possible, you have some analgesic that you're actually having the sedative effect as well. <coughs> Surgical factor, the severity, uh, certain, certain drug you can, you don't want to actually uh, interfere with your healing process, then you actually uh, need to actually choose that. <coughs> Nursing factor, how they deliver the drugs or that. Okay, if you got PCA, physical patient control anesthesia, then maybe you actually want to do that. <coughs> of course, you cannot run away, the cost. <coughs> Other factor, I whether um, certain certain interactions or the drug, you need to consider that as well. Yeah? Treatment of the other treatment that patient have. <coughs> so at least you have to know eh, the drug interaction and antagonist agonistic effect of the certain certain pain relief. <coughs> So the commonly used, used drug is NSAID, opioids, local anesthetic. So, and then the efficacy depends on the type of drug, concentration of the dose, route of administration, or you add on with any vasoconstrictors agent in, within the drugs. <coughs> uh, vasoconstrictor usually will actually uh, reduce the efficacy of the drug, but increase the dosage that you can actually use. <coughs> All right? So, in general, you have to cause pain first before you actually relieve the pain. But don't worry, like I said earlier on, they will never remember this. They will rem they remember the actual fact that caused the pain. If that's not controlled, that the complaint will come. Huh? You are actually giving them with big needle, so painful, so they will never remember. They will remember the actual cause of pain. This is when you want to control their pain, they will they will never remember that. <coughs> okay, the problem with a uh, uh, drug of pain relief, they actually got the side effect as well, and the side effect is similar to when you didn't control the pain. Huh? It will affect the all the system as well. Huh? Gastrointestinal instruction, anti platelet activity, decreased renal blood flow. So end up with the uh, injury as well and allergic reactions so that. Uh. But the good thing is, it's quite safe because our dosage is actually much lower than the, uh, the maximum dose in, in Malaysia. I've used to work in, in, in Bangkok. Chlorohydrate, I thought giving 75 milligram per kg is high already. Uh. In Bangkok, they give 100 milligram per kg and nothing happened. Uh, so, because the maximum dose is about 200, 150, 200. Am I right, Ernest? <laughs> but we're giving ACV just 50, quarter of it. <clears throat> Alright? So, when we give the effective pain management in the patient, patient will be comfort and satisfaction. You can get earlier mobilization, you will reduce hospital stay, of course, you will reduce the cost, right? So, what's next? <clears throat> uh, analgesic corridor. Okay, this is very important. Um, we we never been taught last time we did medical school what we are talking about. Uh, any analgesic corridor, isn't it? <clears throat> it's about the constant range of blood level within which they will obtain pain relief. Huh? The problem is. Because when you are talking about modulating the, the certain certain system in your body, and you know our system is not is not identical in comparison to others, uh, it depends on certain other other factor. Your activity, huh? when you are talking about your activity, your the, your blood flow throughout the body, your body mass, huh? your blood volume, so that's all actually contributing. That's, so that's why you got a quite wide range of corridor. So you have to be aware of it. And this is the reason you need to actually listen to your patient. Huh? You dah bagi banyak ni, then still complain. Then you start go to 
mengada-ngada this patients. No, this shouldn't be like that. It's supposed to be, oh, that's maybe because of the SNS analgesi corridor. Alright? So, listen to your vision. <coughs> so, analgesi corridor is how you are actually giving good amount to reduce the pain but avoiding the side effects, so in between. Eh? So give too little, patient have pain, you give too much, you got other um, side effect. <coughs> eh? Look at this. <coughs> From HKL. Eh? Between patient, there is 5-4 variation in blood level of opioid needed for analgesia. Oh, lima kali ganda, beza. That's what you are talking about, the variabilities of the uh, uh, pain control. <coughs> so, if, if if nothing you can actually accept today is just remember that pain is variable in terms of their presentation, in terms of their response, in terms of the patient. And then whatever it is, listen to your patient. Okay? Then only you actually will initiate you to go and read about what drug you're going to use, what's the best administrations, and how uh, the variability of treatment will affect differently of your patients. <clears throat> the key word is you have to go and read. Right? So aim, so the aim is always patients are comfortable. Right? So that's why now almost every hospital got this scale. Lah. At least they got a, a, a so-called documented way of telling uh, their doctors that the pain relief is uh, enough. Hmm? So, semua orang familiar with this, this chart, isn't it? Okay, okay, cheerio, or oh, tak sedap tak ni, oh, cannot see anything. <coughs> so, <coughs> it's always come up to the effective energy, yeah? how much is enough, how much is too much. Okay? So, you have to go continuous monitoring with your patients. That's why that, that PCA is very popular. Uh, patients got have they have that um, control themselves, but again, uh, you are actually being controlled by by the setting up of the machines. And if you notice that the, our PCA also is still actually at the level of uh, usual uh, maximum dose of of administrations. Ah, tak ada orang berani nak go double with the PCA. So that's, you cannot do anything lah because this is actually a policy set up by the Ministry of Health. <coughs> Alright, so that is general about the pain control. NS, MO, okay. <laughs> for the surgeon, then this is more, uh, or, or for, for you all lah. As, as, as a managing doctor to control is actually more uh, procedural that so you have to remember the general concept of it okay <clears throat> alright so local anesthesia everybody uh, familiar with it eh? so you either you have a local infiltrations or you do a nerve block eh? okay <clears throat> type of injection that anesthesia has small area so just one or two teeth in the associated area and the system get processed at the nerve terminal. Okay, you block there. Huh? Remember when the nerve is still normal. Okay, or sort of normal. Inflamed nerve, it will never work. Huh? Remember that. Okay, if you have an inflamed nerve, you have to go a nerve block, more distant nerve block. Huh? So never patient datang to you with jerawat besar, nana, and then you want to actually move, and then you inject into that 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 nana, it will never work. <coughs> so you have to go to the normal tissue, huh? because nerve end is inflamed already, inflamed and edematous. So you will you will never uh, accept the block already. <coughs> nerve block when you actually block the near larger nerve trunk okay <clears throat> or you can have a topical anesthesia and it's quite good all right <clears throat> local you can have emla huh? you got lozenge you got spray now huh? 
systemic, you can actually even give a fentanyl patch or whatever, that is actually a systemic. The problem with the local uh, topical is doctors is not to suffer, what? Uh, sabar enough. Huh? You letak tu you nak buat ni. Huh? You know very well we are talking about infiltration to the skin. We take some time. Huh? For example, <coughs> emla. Emla, you are talking about passing through the keratinized skin. Remember the anatomy? Keratinized skin atas tu. Huh? Of course, it will take some time to actually soften up. This is dead. Dead skin. Huh? Certain what? Corneum. Alright. <coughs> so it would say time time to soften up that certain corneum before it go and absorb by certain. Nah, baru tadi lecture. Listen them. Ah, <coughs> after that, certain. Ah, granulosum. Ah, in fact, that is the area where the absorption is actually the most effective. Granulosum. After that is spinosum. <coughs> Very good. <laughs> so it will absorb by the granulosum the, the most, and then only it goes into the spinal cell to actually block the nerve. <clears throat> okay, and then it will need, it need some time. For EMLA, usually minimum. Minimum will take half an hour. <clears throat> so you have to plan. Lah. Jangan patient datang to go to EMLA to what? Of course, still pain. Huh? Plan. Apply EMLA. Let them be somewhere first, and you do something else, and then only you come back. Eh? I, for Embla, will usually wait for 45 minutes. Eh? Personally. Eh? I remember I've tried. Eh? Last time I wait for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. The best is 45 minutes. <clears throat> Lozenge, of course, is faster because you're talking about mucosa. There's no corneum there. So that's why it's always straight away to your life cell. So it will absorb faster. Lose almost uh, about 10 15 minutes, it's circular okay, okay already. <coughs> uh, you numb the whole uh, oral. Spray again, depend on where you actually spray. Uh, your your ethyl uh, chloride to the skin, remember? You spray until it freeze, didn't it? Uh, and then quite a lot. Some, uh, some of. Uh, uh, some of us just spray that they say it would never work. Hmm? <clears throat> or you can have actually a local regional block by a beer's block. Huh? Beer's block, uh, familiar. Uh, in, for, in fact, it's actually historical already now. How many of you still see beer's block? How many of you work in orthopedic? None. None. So how many of you have seen Beers block? None. Uh, see, historical already. <coughs> uh, because now NX is very good. That's why it become historical already Beers block. You now you go on the uh, regional block. Uh, because Beers is very dangerous. <coughs> yes, you are doing the double tonique, alright? You put a tonique, proximal, proximal calf, and you inject local anesthetic agent into your vein uh, into your vein uh, for 5-10 uh, minutes it depends on the what agent you are using and then after that you inflate the distal calf alright now initial is actually very painful to put the uh, tonic on top of that no anesthetic okay then after that when you actually anesthetize you put the second uh, calf lower one is actually on the anesthetized area so that's the, the, the reason uh, you do a beer kalau you nak buat procedure with the proximal <coughs> calf then uh, the, your patient will stand maybe 5-10 minutes only kalau you got a procedure more than that then they will actually scream <coughs> so beer's block is actually putting the anesthetic agent into the circulation distal to tonique and that tonique is actually being changed initially proximal and then after that, tonic on the anesthetic. The, uh, the, the problem with beer's block is you need a big amount of the local anesthetic to get the effect. Yeah, lah, you, are, you are talking about filling up the whole limb. Kalau upper limb, maybe lah. Lower limb cannot lah. Too big. Too big and the amount is too big. Huh? Of course, the whoever 
pro for pierce block said that okay when you do a procedure you remove quite an amount of the blood blood means that amount of the blood with the amount of the local anesthesia agent being taken out during the surgery but remember you are actually giving the uh, drug into uh, intravascular but they actually goes into interstitial when you actually inject already it's just that you're fast enough maybe you still stay in your, your blood vessel so that's the reason why beers is not uh, popular <coughs> but if you are working alone tak ada anesthesis in fact this is a very good ways of uh, doing procedure not for a laser whatever lah huh? where you're talking about cutting your 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 skin and then doing procedure then you got a chance of removing the agent during the surgery you buat laser you bagi beers after you remove the tourniquet the total amount is still actually going to your 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 circulations so it's supposed to be usually it's still a, a, a lot huh? So commonly used is actually lidocaine, bufiocaine, uh, ropivacaine. It's all short term, intermediate, or long, 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 uh, like the long acting uh, uh, agent. <clears throat> so it produces reversible blockade of neurotransmission in autonomic sensory and motor nerve fiber. So blood depend on the individual drug characteristic, concentration, and dose used, and, and the patient factor, and more cause drug toxicity. All right. Always choose when it's necessary yeah, because it's actually quite destructive during the facial block. Although it's actually when you know the technique is very safe, but always use accordingly. If, if you need, you think that it's actually enough with the blood, go ahead with the blood. Tak ada yang nak advantage apa eventually using the facial block. Uh, of course, facial block good because of uh, longer pain relief. Yeah, depend on the agent. You put buffy uh, again, then. Uh, but, if you put a long acting, then it becomes longer, four, six hours. If you've got short acting, it's actually um, chapter. In fact, MLA is actually quite long, no? the coverage. Huh? For so far that post-operatively, I would say that around one hour, something like that, it's still painless. <coughs> okay, um, always need to know just the anatomy of it. Okay, I said earlier on, seven. Huh? you got all... Uh, Auricular temporal, this is from the uh, great auricular nerve. Okay, so you got a, a, a facial, you got mental, and then you got infra orbital, you got supra trochlear, supra orbital. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Huh? Seven spot that you need to actually block your face, <coughs> both sides. Eh? Huh? It's just that there is some. Time you go into your columella, there is a usually small ethmoid uh, branch of the uh, uh, it's still infraorbital, nah. ophthalmic, something like that. So, nose is actually got another series. Lah, eh? So, that's, that's the only thing that you need to block. Seven uh, big trunk. Lah. You, you, uh, you go on the nerve end, then it's a bit more. <coughs> Okay, so this is how it goes. You got ophthalmic, you got the the maxillary, and then you got the mandibular. By logic, can you go and block this this trunk? Then you will actually block all. Eh? The problem is you go block this one is going to be very deep and very close to that uh, sinus. <coughs> so it takut masuk dalam tu lah. And and uh, it has to be uh, very specific and a very uh, small window of error but compared to you go on the distal part eh? you just need to know the directions of the nerve and how they actually came out from the certain certain foramen so you go towards that that wall of foramen then it will be very safe be protected by the bone eh? and and the bone is quite thick eh? so you, you feel the you hit the bone, of course, you go slowly, right? So, even the middle wall, uh, or middle wall, thin bone also, you cannot go through. So, it's quite safe. <coughs> right? Uh, this is a repeat. <coughs> okay, so, 
this is three part when you want to block the middle face eh? middle face you just need to actually supraorbital supratrochlear and infratrochlear infraorbital and mental okay All right that is middle face i said i said earlier on you got that sometimes kind of as uh for nerve end is come up into your your piece or your columella so you can actually always put some one one cc there lah. <coughs> so uh, the way <coughs> always is still palpable this area is quite thin the skin is quite thin you can actually palpate the notch the infraorbital notch just go below it because it actually come up and put the needle draw and then go give one to two uh, meal Huh? The problem with us sometimes we are actually afraid to give more because it, we, we will it will swell. Huh? Don't worry, it will swell as long as you don't hit the vessel. It will swell just for that time. You just do a massage, it will be flat already. So it will absorb very fast. <coughs> when it says one, one lah. Huh? In certain certain area you need two. Huh? For example, <coughs> this loose area, submen upper uh, mental nerve, you actually give a bit more. Uh, because it's actually a very loose area uh, so that's why it doesn't cover and then they got small small branch very fast when they came up with the problem so you need extra amount to actually cover quite a big area right infraorbital you need uh, one to two or so because it's actually quite big nerve trunk so sometimes they actually spark uh, very fast uh, very far so that's why you need to be a bit more <coughs> Supratrochlear, supraorbitus, very small nerve, very one straightforward. So maybe one male is actually enough, right? Ah, <coughs> uh, dragon medically, ah, uh, say that's why lah. <coughs> so dragon medical facial is actually at the um at your, the reflections of the lateral uh, orbital wall and the for upper temporal. So. It's actually something like a, a, a crater there. So it's always safe for you to go as long as you don't go anterior to the, your atlet, upper lateral orbiter, then you will see there is actually a crater there. So we never uh, go through your eye. So hit that, draw a bit, and then inject. Here, uh, which is supra orbiter, you direct your, your, your uh, needle. Um, Upward and laterally, so you will never come to your your this one. The infraorbital nerve, don't worry, because the gap between the orbital margin to that 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 foramen is quite far, one to two centimeter. Kalau you ganas agak masuk all the way, yalah you can go. Huh? Just that be careful with children. Huh? So children always direct that way, huh? from lateral. Huh? Because you go that way, if children sometimes they flex their head when you actually give the, the locker. So, you can accidentally pass through the orbiter when they actually flex their, their, their head. <coughs> okay, facial block. Alright, now for the hand, <coughs> this is very... Now, the hand of, of uh, aesthetic treatment of hand is become very popular now. Uh, because of the reason I said earlier on, uh, it has to be uh, comparable in terms of the use of the face, of the body, and the hand. And hand is uh, the exposed area as well. Uh, so you might do a fraction of CO2 for hand, for example. Uh, failure for hand. Uh, certain, certain person, person wants uh, fullness of the tina, for example. Uh, that is a uh, quite prominent when you have a tina and at a, a, a you got a, a, a full shiny face but you got hollow tina some of them want the uh, filler for example here there and this is at uh, this area we are talking about palm is very painful so you need to control the pain first uh, the simple is actually you can actually give do a wrist block <coughs> so wrist you got the you need to block the radial nerve, you need to block the ulnar nerve, and then the median nerve. <coughs> so, uh, for radial nerve, you actually have to locate the radial styloid. Eh? Inject 5 mm LA subcutaneously, immediate proximal to radial styloid, first medially over the wrist crease. Okay? 
Understand? Uh? You, 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 you can take this lecture, no, don't worry. <coughs> and what I want you to actually uh, take note is, see? Five mil. Huh? Usually when you are actually uh, new, you're very afraid to actually give that amount. Huh? The small area, but imagine you give five mil. You want to block this one. Huh? Then, then you can actually test when patient feel the electrifying pain, then you know that you're actually hitting the nerve. Don't worry about hitting the nerve because you will heal. Huh? So you just need to grow a bit and then inject. In fact, when you actually uh, easily block, for example, that's the sign that you look for. Huh? <clears throat> Same thing, uh, when you go on the distal part, remember you, when you go on more distal, you got a, a superficial uh, radial now that actually come up uh, quite distal. But sometimes you actually need to go and block the snap box. When 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 you block the radial, it doesn't work because why? Because sometimes this upper superficial branch of radial nerve come early. They come much earlier, so you block sini, they are actually not covered. So that's why you go on the snap box. <coughs> Right. Um, sometimes you need to do a wrist block when you want to work on the forehead, for, for, forearm. <coughs> right. So, a uh, few nerve also lah. Um, Alna nerve, medial nerve, and radial nerve. Some more. Yeah. The problem with the uh, wrist block is the what we call a nerve rectification in between them. Sat is actually uh, much richer. So sometimes it doesn't uh, cover that that good compared to the more distal nerve. <coughs> the key point is uh, give surrounding. So after you give a targeted uh, 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 block, and then on top of that, you give a uh, subcutaneous uh, round the circumferential uh, blockade. So that will actually um, block the cutaneous part of the sens sensory that rectified between the <coughs> Ring block, uh, this is very simple. Um, you know very well when you want to block the, the ring, you just need to flex and then the tip of the flexure of the interphalangeal joint, that is the tip where your nerve is still run. So you just need to go to do and on that line and then block, give a local. And again, very small space, very uh, scary to give big amount, isn't it? But it's been suggested that you need to give one, one meal to the each, each side. So it's a usable to be uh, two meals. Two meals is called big, you know, to, to for your finger. But don't worry. <clears throat> and be careful when you are actually blocking the distal small digit. Remember, don't don't give adrenaline <clears throat> because you will turn into a spasm, and then you will end up um, fainted coat, seeing that your your finger is white doesn't bleed. <clears throat> uh, but don't worry, actually, not, not that issue because the effect of the adrenaline usually not will last for six more than six hours. But if accidental, you, you actually give a uh, local with adrenaline and you inject the vessel somehow, it will end up with, when because of spasm, and it will end up with the thrombosis. And then you are in the, you're going to be in trouble. So to be safe, don't use adrenaline. You know? Uh, digit. <coughs> so <coughs> that's all about that. Uh, so, but the, and then other thing is you need to know about the LA still. <coughs> I just want to highlight how do you want to actually uh, detect early. Eh? Always keep asking your patient about their their oral mucosa. Huh? Uh, very very oral. This is the first uh, sign. And this is time that you can, when this patient having a discovery, you stop using the local and be prepared with your, your, your isastroli. <coughs> right? The good thing about electricity is treatment usually just supportive, give oxygenations, and cardiovascular support is needed. <coughs> so it's, it's okay, you just wait, because in this, you know that it's reversible. Right? <coughs> you just need the support. Eh? Don't wait until they actually become agitated, hypotension, vertical, their combustion, this is too late. 
right? So always when you use the uh, local anesthesia, especially the, you, you know that you're going to be on the higher dosing side, always keep asking them. Right? Ask them, ask them anything, anything. Every 15, 10, 15 minutes, you're going to ask. Ah, otherwise, you will never know. <coughs> and then you add on, uh, last last you think you are actually at that, that, that level already. Huh? This level is still okay lah. Huh? But when they have, this time you will never know. Uh, but they can also sometimes you don't know. Because you don't put the ECG. <coughs> this is too late already lah. Alright, thank you. <coughs> Four. Hmm. Any question? <clears throat> no question. Either 